Good morning. We start this morning with general questions. Question number one from Anas Sarwar. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on what the top rate of income tax should be. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. In February, the Scottish Parliament endorsed the Scottish Government's proposal that the additional rate of income tax should be maintained at 45 pence for the tax year 2017-18. Analysis produced by the Scottish Government showed that there is a revenue risk associated with raising the additional rate. However, the First Minister has asked the Council of Economic Advisers to consider how and to what extent this risk can be mitigated, and if we are sufficiently assured that it can be, that we consider raising the additional rate from 45 pence to 50 pence from 2018-19 onwards as part of budget uh, considerations. And that's our I thank the Minister for that answer. Last week, the First Minister said that she supported a 50p tax ban as long as it was across the UK, but not in Scotland, in case people chose to leave. Uh, yesterday, the SNP voted against a pay rise for low and middle income earners in the NHS. Why does the Minister think that low income earners in a market which is competitive and wanted right across the globe won't choose to leave Scotland, but high income earners who would have to pay a little bit more tax would leave Scotland? Isn't that a very Tory argument? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I mean, our, our position is we've got the powers to do so to make taxation fair and more proportionate to the ability to pay, whilst also raising the additional revenue. That's the point of taxation, to be able to invest in our uh, public services. That's what we want to achieve. That's why we're taking a methodical uh, approach to this. And there is some irony from the Labour Party talking about uh, uh, low and middle income earners when it was the Labour Party that wanted to increase the basic rate as well, which would have had an impact uh, on those very people. So we'll take the right uh, decisions on tax that's balanced and fair uh, and progressive whilst ensuring that we raise the necessary revenue to invest in our public services. John Mason. Hey, thank you. I, I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary would consider there might be a behavioural change if we change the rates too much and that two pence as an initial difference from the UK rates might be a good starting point. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I thank John Mason for his advice. I'm not setting any parameters at this stage in the uh, parliamentary cycle, but certainly to agree that there are issues around behavioural responses as they relate to, to tax. And of course, that's why we're taking a methodical approach. That's why the First Minister has asked the Council of Economic Advisers to consider the matter uh, so that we can take our tax decisions in light of all available evidence, because absolutely behavioural uh, change uh, and issues around tax avoidance is something that the Scottish Government, indeed the whole Parliament, should consider when it uses the economic uh, levers at our disposal. Murdo Fraser. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary accept there is a high risk of less money being raised by increasing the higher rate through behaviour change, not necessarily through higher earners leaving Scotland, but perhaps by reordering their affairs, so for example they're paid through dividend income rather than through salaries? Will the, the Council of Economic Advisors be taking all these issues into account when it's considering uh, these proposals? Cabinet Secretary. I would agree with Murdo Fraser that there is a, a point around uh, behavioural change and how people uh, deploy uh, various uh, ways to, to engage in, in tax avoidance and that, that is a concern. That is why we have to understand all these issues when we are considering tax. And yes, the Council of Economic Advisers will consider all available e evidence and of course bring their own expertise to, to the table uh, in that regard as well. But I suppose Murdo Fraser's uh, question allows me to also make the point that it would be better if the Scottish Government had full <coughs> control of all of these matters so that there weren't those added opportunities to avoid paying tax in Scotland. Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, would the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that without the Scottish Parliament having powers over, for example, dividend and savings income taxes, taxes impacted by incorporation, including capital gains and corporation tax, and the powers to police tax avoidance, any changes to the top rate of income tax run the risk of reducing rather than increasing funds available for public services in Scotland, and that Labour MSPs would be better placed joining us in arguing for full transfer of those powers to the Scottish Parliament. Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, I do, I do agree with, with that analysis, and that's the case that uh, uh, the uh, uh, government has made around the transfer of all powers in relation to tax to ensure that we can close any loopholes that may exist, and we can also have a coordinated approach in tax to be able to maximise the revenues to invest in our public services. So I think that that... Uh, point is well made and I look forward to what all the uh, parties in the UK general election uh, may have in their uh, manifesto in relation to tax. Well, I suppose thanks to the leak we have an understanding of what the, uh, the Labour Party uh, might be able to do which shows the irony of their position in the UK and uh, in Scotland but we're not, uh, we're not following the Tory proposition just to pass on tax cuts for the rich but raise the necessary revenue to invest in our public services. 
Question two has not been lodged. Question three, Lewis MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government what measures it will take to ensure increased recruitment of students from the north of Scotland to train as teachers at the University of Aberdeen. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Officer, so, so we have taken a series of actions to help address issues around teacher recruitment. These include increasing student intake targets for the sixth year in a row, taking steps to maintain teacher numbers as a central part of our priority to improve education, launched a new teacher recruitment campaign in February of this year, and developed alongside Scottish universities a package of innovative routes to teaching to help encourage more graduates to become teachers. We are very happy to work with local authorities to help tackle teacher shortages in the Aberdeen area. Currently, we are supporting the University of Aberdeen's distance learning programme, which allows local authority staff to train as teachers while remaining in post. And we are funding an extension to this programme so that it covers secondary teaching and is available to all local authorities. We are, committing to, we are committed to considering whether a second cohort of PGDE internships can be supported through the Transition Training Fund. Lewis MacDonald. Clearly, some of these steps are very welcome, and the Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the evidence of Willie MacLeod to the Education and Skills Committee yesterday, in which he highlighted the steps taken by the Western Isles Council in order to uh, recruit and retain trainee teachers from within their local area. Recognising, as, as uh, the Cabinet Secretary clearly does, the need for further action to address the recruitment crisis across the north of Scotland. Will he have further discussions with the University of Aberdeen about what more can be done to enable those types of local imaginative innovative schemes, uh, not just in the Western Isles, not just in Aberdeen, but right across uh, the north and northeast of Scotland, where recruiting and retaining uh, trainee teachers is such a critical and pressing problem? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I welcome Lewis MacDonald's uh, comments and, uh, and the thoughtful nature that uh, uh, underpins them. Uh, this is a problem which is not just in Scotland or just in the northeast of Scotland. Um, it's a problem that's widespread. Um, I was at the International Summit of the Teaching Profession just before the Easter recess and across about 20 jurisdictions, including some highly respected jurisdictions around the world, uh, there are inc increasing shortages of teachers. So we have to be innovative and creative about the approaches that we take to encouraging teachers to join the teaching profession. And I can assure uh, Mr. MacDonald that the government will work very closely with the University of Aberdeen and with the local authorities in the northeast of Scotland uh, to work jointly on solutions that will deliver the objectives that we all share in this respect. Question number four, Joan McAlpine. Uh, thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to mitigate the cumulative effect of UK benefit reductions in Dumfries and Galloway. Minister Jean Freeman. The UK Government will have cut £1 billion a year from welfare spend in Scotland by 2022, with a quarter of a billion coming through changes introduced last month alone. We have taken a number of actions to protect the poorest and most vulnerable. These include since 2013-14, spending over £350 million to enable us to fully mitigate the bedroom tax so that 70,000 households save around £650 per year, help 241,000 uh, 241, individual households in crisis through the Scottish Welfare Fund and with a further investment of over £1 billion in the council tax reduction scheme. And as members will know, we have not imposed a two-child cap on that scheme. At a local level, Dumfries and Galloway has received over £30.5 million of this mitigation funding. However, it has to be said that the Scottish Government should not have to mitigate cuts and policies, which this Parliament has not and I believe would not vote for. Joe McAlpine. I thank the Minister for that answer. One of the most recent uh, uh, stories about the ongoing cuts has been the effect on motability vehicles. The charity Muscular Dystrophy UK found that 900 people a week are losing their motability vehicle due to the reassessment of personal independence payments. And that is uh, uh, having a very devastating effect on people in rural areas such as Dumfries and Galloway, where the vehicle is a vital lifeline for everyday life, including getting to and from work. Does the minister agree with me that this is completely unacceptable? Minister. I, I thank the member for that supplementary. The Conservative government, of course, tell us that their welfare policies are designed to help people into employment. Even in their own terms then, and even if we believed them, the significant impact on the loss of mobility vehicles on individuals, particularly, as the member says, on those living in rural communities like her own and indeed mine. 
uh, is considerable. What we do know is that the Conservative government, whether it's about austerity or welfare cuts on the back of the poor, have no care and no recognition of the damage caused by their policies. In Scotland, we are doing things differently. We are working with mobility to ensure it continues to be available when we take on the delivery of those benefits in our rights-based social security system, and it will be a system based on dignity and respect. Question number five, Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on plans to increase the capacity of the Edinburgh City Bypass. Minister Hamza Youssef. The Scottish Government is committed to undertaking improvements on the Edinburgh City Bypass and announced the preferred option for the upgrade of Sheriff Hall roundabout on the 3rd of April. Transport Scotland is now taking forward the detailed development and assessment of the preferred option in line with the statutory process. Miles Briggs. I thank the Minister for that answer. Recent studies have suggested that the city bypass is amongst the most congested stretches of trunk road anywhere in the UK, and the Scottish Government's own figures now expect an extra 10,000 vehicles per day to be using the bypass by 2022. While the long overdue improvements at Sheriff Hall are indeed welcome and must be constructed without further delay, can the Minister set out to Parliament in detail what specific plans the Government has and is working on to increase capacity along the length of the bypass and whether it supports the use of smart motorway technology to allow hard shoulders to be used during peak times? Minister. These, uh, of course, <coughs> improvements will make a, a big difference to those that are coming into Edinburgh, leaving Edinburgh and the surrounding uh, southeast of Scotland area. What I would say to him is that we've been making an improvement since we came into power and took, this, uh, took on uh, this government in 2007. So 2008, there was a £2.2 million uh, lane widening uh, project for Sheriff Hall. Uh, the £30 million construction of the Dalkeith bypass, which included the Miller Hill interchange at the A720 as well. But in terms of his uh, question on smart technology, yes, it's a big part and a big component of uh, what we do in terms of infrastructure improvements. In 2015, we installed road stud lane markings, which illuminate in conjunction with traffic lights. So we're already doing some of that. Uh, where we can do that further will be part of the A720 CES plans cross-boundary study, which we're taking forward uh, with the local regional transport partnership and the local authority. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. With reference to the proposals to improve the Sheriff Hall roundabout, Will there be provision to allow cyclists to safely traverse that roundabout? Many from my constituency, when they're travelling from the A7 into Edinburgh, because at the moment, anyone on a bike takes their life in their hands trying to go round the Sheriff Hall roundabout. Minister. Uh, yes, uh, suitable provisions for all users, including cyclists, is an important part of the proposed improvements to Sheriff Hall roundabout, and this will be developed in further detail as we progress the development uh, the assessment of the preferred option in consultation with local interest groups. But it is an issue that has been raised by many of those organisations that are representing the cycling uh, lobby, uh, one that we will and are giving careful consideration to. Question number six, Maurice Corrie. Officer, um, to ask the Scottish Government how many homeless veterans were recorded in Scotland in each of the last three years. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. In 2015-16, Official statistics record 922 homeless applications where the main applicant applied directly from armed services accommodation or the application included a household member formally in the armed services. That's the lowest number recorded to date. This represents 2.7% of all homeless applications. In 2014-15, these numbers were recorded at 959 and 1,008 in 2013-14. Maurice Curry. I thank the Minister for that answer. I understand that much of the housing provided to veterans is through charitable organisations such as the Scottish Veterans Set Residencies and also Homes for Heroes and others. We are very grateful to these charities for their relentless efforts to keep veterans off the streets. However, charities do not have the same funds to be the main providers and of, of housing for veterans. Veterans housing is for full capacity and have waiting lists and there is little effort being made by the Scottish Government to encourage local authorities to offer more housing to veterans. Scottish veterans are also reported to be 10% more likely to be homeless than veterans in England. Will the Scottish Government therefore look into working more closely with charities and local authorities to close the gap to be at least the same or better than England in their treatment of veterans, resettlement and housing? Minister. 
Officer, the government has worked closely with veterans charities, including giving £1.3 million to the Veterans Garden City Association. Yes. Uh, and also, we are working with local authorities to improve uh, homelessness services for all. And of course, we have our 50,000 affordable homes target. Um, I read with interest yesterday, um, President Officer, the Daily Record, uh, where Cami McLeod from Who Cares uh, who Dares Cares um, said that the treatment of vet veterans was a, a horrifying indictment of modern Britain. The Tory government have presided over a, ra a rise in insecure employment, welfare cuts and ideologically driven austerity, all of which has uh, contributed to the major increase in the need for additional homelessness services and food provision across the UK. However, we have seen the Scottish Tories, who are apologists for the rape, rape clause, so I don't think we should hold our breath, waiting for them to stand up to Theresa May or anyone else, even when it means veterans, families and pensioners are being pushed into poverty and crisis due to their policies. Yeah. Question number seven, Tom Arthur. Government, whether it will provide an update on any assessment it has made of the potential impact of automation and artificial intelligence on the economy. Minister Jimmy Hepburn. The Scottish Government continues to monitor the emerging evidence base around automation and artificial intelligence and its implications for Scotland's economy. In April, Scottish Enterprise published a research report on the potential impacts of automation on Scotland's construction industry, the food supply chain and financial and business services. The research found that by 2025, automation is likely to contribute to net employment growth that new industries will be formed to provide and service new automation solutions, and within user sectors, the, co the company growth realised by automation will require increased employment. Technological change and issues such as automation will have a significant impact over the next few decades, creating both challenges and opportunities for business and employees across Scotland. As highlighted in Scotland's labour market strategy, we will take forward analysis of issues like this in the future and help employers and employees respond to them positively with the support of the strategic labour market group. Tom Arthur. I uh, thank the Minister for that answer. The Minister will be aware of the recent IPPR report on the future of work and the skill system in Scotland, which highlighted that over 46% of jobs, that's 1.2 million in Scotland, are at risk from automation. Uh, can the Minister outline what action the Government is taking to ensure that Scotland's skill system is able to continue to support Scotland's workforce as automation changes the nature of work? Minister. I am indeed aware of the IPPR report. Uh, I view this as a welcome addition to our understanding of these matters. Uh, I know, as I have uh, said, that automation and technological change will have profound impacts on the way we work in the uh, future. Uh, as uh, I said out, our labour market strategy recognises that. Recognizes that. Uh, of course, what we uh, see is that uh, we do not uh, exactly understand entirely what the impact uh, will be. That is why there has been a range of research commissioned. Uh, indeed, the OECD, taking a different approach to IPPR, have estimated that around 12 per cent of UK jobs might be affected by automation, a rather smaller figure than the IPPR. Uh, I recognise that automation may uh, pose challenges for uh, the way we work in the future, particularly for those in uh, low-skilled jobs. Scotland's workforce is, of course, uh, highly educated, uh, flexible and adaptable. It is already responding well to the challenges of the 21st century through our enterprise and skills a review aimed to create a coherent enterprise and skills system which can ensure this continues to be the case. In relation to the IPPR report, they talked about mid-career uh, provision to allow people to progress in the workplace. Our enterprise and skills review plays a, a role in that. Of course, we have the Flexible Workforce Development Fund and uh, individual training accounts that we've set out that can help here as well. And we'll always be willing to consider what else we can do. Dean Lockhart. Thank you. In January this year, the UK Government published a draft industrial strategy containing a series of measures to capitalise on emerging economies, uh, technologies in the economy, including automation. Leading organisations, including the Royal Society of Edinburgh and the Scottish Whisky Association, have called on the Scottish Government to actively participate in this industrial strategy. Can the Minister therefore explain, uh, therefore explain what steps have been taken by the Scottish Government to actively participate in this industrial policy? Minister. To engage with the UK government in these matters and know the Cabinet Secretary for uh, Economy, Jobs and Fair Work has been doing precisely that and will continue to engage. Question 8, Mary Fee. To ask the Scottish Government how it will support the recruitment of additional teachers and classroom assistants in West Scotland. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Uh, the Scottish Government is taking a number of actions to help recruit teachers. We are spending £88 million this year to make sure every school has access to the right number of teachers. We have increased student-teacher intake targets for the sixth year in a row, 
and we are setting targets to train teachers in the subjects where they are needed most. We are also supporting innovative new routes into teaching, including work with the Universities of Glasgow and Strathclyde. The recruitment and deployment of support staff is a matter for education authorities in light of local circumstances and priorities, including their statutory duties. Mary Fee. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Recent Scottish Government figures have highlighted a worrying trend across West Scotland, with class sizes rising and teacher numbers decreasing. In Renfrewshire, the percentage of pupils in Primary 1 to Primary 3 in classes with 18 pupils or fewer has declined from 33% in 2010 to 13% in 2016, whilst the average class size for Primary 5, 6 and 7 in Renfrewshire is over 26 pupils. Furthermore, over the last decade of SNP rule, teacher numbers have declined significantly. In North Ayrshire, teacher numbers have fallen by 105 since 2007, whilst Inverclyde now has 175 fewer teachers than a decade ago. With these statistics in mind, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what specific plans the Scottish Government has to place in, in place to reverse this worrying trend of larger class sizes and fewer teachers across West Scotland, which result in increased workload for teachers and decreased contact time between teachers and pupils. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, the Government has attached a very high priority to maintaining teacher numbers, and we had to do that because we faced a number of Labour local authorities that were absolutely determined to reduce teacher numbers, and I wouldn't have it. So I'm, I'm delighted, I'm delighted, I'm delighted that as a result of the government's strong action in this respect, we see an increasing number of teachers in our schools and our classrooms, and I'm delighted that the £120 million that the government has made available directly to the schools of our country, which the Labour Party voted against every single one of them, is now recruiting more teachers in our classrooms and assisting in the delivery of education in Scotland. And I would have thought Mary Fee would have welcomed that. Yeah, yeah.